I'm going to talk about learning and learning hashing, which is a very well-known technique for large-scale computer vision problems. And just to fix few ideas of what I mean by large-scale computer vision problems, here are just reporting numbers. So as you can see, YouTube stores something like 40, 40 million hours of recording per year. Facebook stores billions of images per month. And even this large collection of data, which is fast growing, we, we need methods which are able to index and retrieve in such large collections in a very efficient manner. And this is indeed the similarity sensitive hashing uh, goal, where in the setting what we have is some input data. Here we've just shown some images. And what we assume is that these images are embedded in some tissue space. And what we also know is that we know a binary similarity among images which means that we can sample two images and we can assess whether they belong to the same class or they have some underlying similarity which can describe them. So given this annotated data, what we want to do, we want to learn function H, which brings us from the feature space to the hanging space. So we want to go to the space of binary vectors. And obviously this is a much more compact representation, which has also the nice property to have a very efficient distance from distance computation, which can be done in reasonable size vectors in one plot size. And obviously, H can be any, any function. And in, as we are interested in large scale problems, obviously, we cannot resort to exhaustive search, which means if I want to retrieve some samples, I cannot go and list them all in, in my database. So, what I have to do, I have to define all the amenable of radius R, which is a set of results that I want to consider for my retrieval. And obviously, the best, the best case scenario for these applications is when you have collision. So, when you consider radius to zero, and still you obtain a very good performance. And this is also because you can use a table, which means a linear vector, and then you go in your table, and then you have all your indices, and that's what you have to achieve. So the retrieval time does not depend on the number of data points that you have. And in general, when you want to apply this form of retrieval for arbitrary uh, retrieval ready, what you have is that these rows as M choose R. And what you have in a retrieval system is that you would like to have three things. Efficient search in terms of speed, high precision, and high volume. But unfortunately, these are three set of contradicting trade-offs. And these are two plots which are taken from Graham and Curtis, which are trying to explain this problem. So if you want high precision, what you do usually is increase the code length. And if you increase the code length, what you see on the left is that this efficient trick for retrieving uh, a small rally becomes uh, really unfeasible, even for small, small ready. In that case, after three, for example, you resort to force, which means that your system is already too slow. And on the other hand, what you see is that the average number of neighbors <coughs> sharply decreases when you increase the code, which means that you end up having very low code. So what we argue here in this work is that we need to have structure to the space of these codes so that we can limit the degrees of freedom that these codes have. And we do it by adding sparsity, which is just one of the possibilities in order to, to achieve this goal. And the loss function that we end up minimizing is the classical loss function for dot link, which we apply already for learning similarity sensitive caching. So you have the first term, which tries to put things which are similar to the same point, so it tries to, to get collision. And then the second term, which tries to put things which are dissimilar to similar points in the hanging space. And then the last one, which is obviously sparse. And as I said, this is efficiently minimized in terms of uh, semi architecture. And obviously, we have a model, which is a function we want to learn. And we can cast this. We can learn it to gradient descent in a very efficient manner. And as you're interested in sparse codes, what we use is a particular type of architecture, which is the Lista network, which is a learnable ISTA, followed by a binary algebra, which is in the end what we want. We want the threshold of zero and obtain our binary vector. So this is just a smooth approximation of the sine function, which allows us to do that well in traditional fashion. And the first result I want to show you is the effect of sparsity on the codes. So here what I'm showing is a comparison with respect to other previous state-of-the-art approaches on, in terms of unique codes. And this is on C410. So you have 60,000 images. And as you see, all the standard dentage methods, what they, they do, they try to cover uniform this space. And this result results in a very low number of average neighbors. And so low recall. What we have with sparsity is that we have greater and less number of unit codes, 
and plus we have a Hamming radius of 0, 1, and 2, a much larger number of retreat samples. And those, these are just numbers that tell that we have a lot of neighbors, but we want good neighbors. And that's what I'm trying to show here. So here I'm showing precision recoil curves for all the methods when we consider the Hamming radius equals to the equal length, in this case 48 feet. So this is brute force. And obviously we lose a little bit with respect to the KSH and NHH methods. But what we're interested in is showing that when we reduce the retrieval radius to two, then thanks to sparsity, thanks to this constraint on the number of individual prisms, you end up having a much higher recalling precision altogether with respect to the other approaches. And this is the same also when you consider radius of zero, so when you and another interesting uh, plot is this one where we plotted recall and Hamming versus Hamming radius. And what we want to show is that when you give the Hamming radius small, what you have is that the recall is much higher for sparse hash. And what you would like to do is to have this method which has the same performance when you increase the number of dimensions. And this is what I'm, seeing, uh, what I'm showing here. So here we have 120 dimensions. All the dense hash methods have a sharp decrease, which is known to happen because they have no constraint. And in our case, first hash has a consider considerably better performance. And also, if you notice, the performance actually increases. Because at this point, 120 dimensions are roughly comparable with the 48 dimensions of dense hash codes in terms of digital freedom. And this is another plot which tries to explain why this is beneficial. So here I'm plotting precision recall versus time. Everything is done with the tables. So obviously when you have collision, radius equals to zero, that's the most efficient way you can do the trigger. And what is nice to see is that sparse hash as a recalling precision, which all together are better than all the other methods, even when you consider it ready altitude, which obviously involves a much slower search time. And these are just a few examples from the C410 data set. You have your image video on the left, lens of retrieval samples. Obviously, it's not perfect, but it's doing a decent job. And this brings me to what I believe is the most interesting, at least for me, problem for similarity centric caching, dealing with multimodal data. Every day, I mean, we're surrounded by a lot of data which comes in different values. And this is just an example of Wikipedia. When we're reading this page, and we know that there's some text. It's an image representation. And for us, it's easy to understand that obviously the text relates to the image and vice versa. But at the end, it's not clear how to deal with these two spaces in a common fashion. So, how to bring them so that we can compare images and text, and ultimately compare F and Dorothy in a mutually comparable space, which is the final goal. And thanks to the implementation using Siamese networks, this was very easy to do. So here we have image model, text model, and obviously we want to bring the two hash functions to the Hamming space, which, which is joint space for these two models. So what we assume here is that we have intermodal similarities, binary as usual. So you have similarities for the images, similarities for the text. And then what is important is that you assume that you have some intermodals, since intermodal similarities. Are which means that you can sample an image, you can sample a text, and then you can say whether they're similar or they describe the same concept or not. And this allows you to couple these two spaces into this joint handling space. And obviously, the naive way of doing it, which is also the most effective and efficient way of doing it, is by coupling these two Eastern networks. So you have two networks, and then you couple them with the cross model loss, which is basically a meta <laughs> Simon's network. And what is nice is that H and G are trying to learn so you don't have to resort to these two-step optimizations and so on. And after you train the system, with stochastic gradient descent, so it scales well to large data sets and so on. Here, I'm just showing some examples for text-based image retrieval. So the data here is a loose data set, so there are 270,000 images taken from Flickr, and the image modality is a back of uh, features of 100 dimensions and text representation is a thousand dimensional vector, where you have a one the location of the given keyword. In this case, we made up this vector of people born in the art and we compared with cross model SSH, which is a linear technique, which was previously the art. It's actually one of the few techniques which are trying to use in this problem. And as you see, sparse cache is a considerable uh, better performance. 
And what is nice is also in this case where we were interested in retrieving flower and art, and you see that the second image of the bird statue is indeed a face. But what is nice is that the uh, the image has, uh, to the image has been applied a filter, which is an artistic filter. So it, it makes plausible to assign that image to the category art. And obviously you can do also the converse. So you can you can have a, an image, you can fit it to the system, and then in this joint space you retrieve nearest neighbors in the text modality. So we retrieve in this case the top five neighbors, then we get all these uh, annotations and we assign them to the image. So we try to do image annotations in this way. Now what, is, what you can see is that compared to the model SSH, we have considerably better performance. In green, I'm showing the results which are in the ground truth of the pure image. And what is nice, in my opinion, is that obviously not all the annotations are right, so you see a lot of black, but in the black you see a lot of annotations which do actually make sense. So the system is somehow able to capture some semantic similarity between text and images, which sometimes is very hard to capture, especially in the data set, which is quite hard enough. I have to admit. So to conclude, what we have presented is a way of defining the conventional similarity sensitization problems to a constraint to limit the degrees of freedom of the code. And we have achieved this goal by having sparsity, which is just the simplest form of the to, to, to simplest form that we could think of to constrain these codes. And we've shown that we can achieve higher code at small ready, which means that we can use the efficient retriever we look at tables. And obviously it scales well because we do everything online. And Thanks to the, similar, to the embedding that we learned in the same session, we can extend arbitrary a large number of uh, modalities. And this one concludes. I thank you for your attention.